Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. It's the kickoff of a new series called Better Together. And let me tell you, um, I know that uh, the next four weeks are going to be very life-changing. And let me just tell you how I was inspired by this. Uh, a good friend of mine named Rusty George, he's the pastor of Real Life, wrote a book called Better Together. And, um, and he and I have been growing in our relationship now probably for a little bit over a year, maybe two years. And, uh, but it's gotten really strong. And, and you know what? Um, he's definitely uh, way further along than I am. He's been in ministry longer than I have. Uh, they're doing more than we are. But it makes total sense because you know what? There's always this beautiful thing called time, right? And, uh, and we're always trying to accelerate the time. And, uh, and if you're not careful, if you accelerate something too fast, then eventually it will hurt you, just like your spiritual growth. Um, there has to be a process uh, of time in everything we do. But, um, but I'm doing something very unique. It's never been done in Santa Clarita. Um, there has never been uh, two pastors from the same city on the same stage on the same day in a church. And uh, a couple weeks from now, we're going to have Pastor Rusty here with me. We're going to tag team. And, um, and why? Because I want you to understand that when we preach these messages, they're just not make me feel better messages. They are messages that should bring uh, conviction, that should bring a challenge. And, uh, and I say challenge because sometimes, you know what, trying to, to invite a community that, that, that maybe you're not comfortable with, and that could even be race. Maybe sometimes, you know what, racially it's difficult for you to connect with maybe um, someone that's African American or Caucasian or Hispanic or or Persian or Indian or whatever. I, I want to challenge us to realize that that we can all be better together, regardless of what our background is. And uh, let me tell you something: real life is definitely completely different from us, which is beautiful. That's why the body is awesome. So. Just, if I were you, I would just come and see us both because, you know what, Pastor Rusty's very, 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 he's very well put together. Where I'm just like wild and all over the place. So just imagine what that's going to look like on that Sunday. We're going to have so much fun here at church. Uh, but I want you to know that, um, that when you do life together with people, it becomes a beautiful thing. And when you see people like, uh, people that got water baptized today, for example, at the, at the 8 a.m., uh, CJ got water baptized. If you don't know CJ, he's a part of our, our media production department. And uh, he was an atheist before he came here. But check this out. He grew up in a, in a, uh, in a not only a Christian home, but he's what they call a PK kid. A PK kid is a pastor's kid. And uh, here you have a, a, a guy who literally grew up in the church, yet didn't believe in God. But someone, everybody say someone. But someone at Elevate Church started bringing him, he started hanging out, volunteering, before he was even saved, before he ever came to the place of knowing God, and as he just kept coming and volunteering here, eventually he gave his life to Christ, he's been a part of our team now, he got water baptized today, but it takes someone, it takes someone to see the potential in you, it takes you to see the potential in someone, and really help them through the process of time to see them be fruitful and, and multiply and be blessed. But that takes people. And, uh, and you know what? I know that the skit was a little hilarious. But that's the reality. Most of us, we play tug of war with ourselves. I think our greatest struggles are not the things that are outwardly. The greatest struggles in life are the things that we deal with inwardly. And many times you're just like you're pulling and you're pulling and you're trying to figure out why am I not further and and why am I not, you know, seeing progress? Well, it's this simple, guys. How many know that we live in a selfie world? You guys ever heard the word or the terminology selfie? You know, selfie is a very big word today. Everywhere you go, it's a part of everyone's language. I think uh, every single week someone says, hey, let's take a selfie. All of us do this. All of us. As a matter of fact, you know what? I think that when you, when you use this word selfie, um, we forget that that the world literally conditions you without even knowing. That's why, see, God is so brilliant because in Romans 12, you know, it, we're talking the Bible was written over 2,000 years ago. 
it was very clear in the scriptures where he said in Romans 12, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Well, the world, and listen, I'm not a world hater. I, lo I, I, I love the people that are in the world, but the world, man, let me tell you something. It will always conform you to get further from God, not get closer to God. This world is not going to inspire you to follow Christ. This world is not going to motivate you to go to church. This world is actually going to keep you distracted and focused on you. Come on, it's always going to be about me, me, me. So when I say that uh, the world is a selfie world, that means that the world teaches us and conforms us to always be self-aware. Come on, you're always checking yourself like nonstop. Self-awareness, uh, self-improvements, self-abilities. And there's nothing wrong with self-improvement, self-awareness, and self-abilities. But the problem is that we are easily becoming consumed self-consumed with ourselves and it looks nothing like God now the word selfie simply came from you know what people taking a picture of themselves right let's just all just take a quick selfie what the heck just do it for fun all right y'all just smile ready one two hold on the, the angle because none of us want a double chin right so just strain it up <laughs> suck it up suck it in ready one two three yeah over here, raise your hands up in the air like you really care. Go. Yeah, okay, you guys, you guys suck. Over here. Ready? Ready? One, two, three, raise your hands in the air because you care. Okay, you guys suck too, man. I'm going to get, someone's going to do this, right? Ready? One, two, three, raise your hands like you care. Woo. Oh, yeah, see, that's the crowd right there. But no, 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 that's how we are. Listen, that's how we are. When someone takes a selfie with you, here's the truth. Let me just, because no one's going to tell the truth, but I will tell the truth. When we look at the picture, like, oh, let me see, let me look at that, let me see. You know you don't give a rip about anyone else in that picture. <laughs> you just want to make sure that you looked good. And you'll say things like this, like, hey, you know, that's an okay You know what, that's an okay picture. I think you'll look better at the next one. And you start doing it, but it's all about you. <laughs> Mom, dad, you know you're the same way too. You take a picture with your kids, come here, babies. And you take the picture like, oh. You don't give a rip about your little princess at that point. You're just saying, okay, I can see my gut right now. And you retake the picture. And we know that selfie simply means this. It's people are literally just taking selfies because they're trying to, to, to find a mark in their life of an event that supposedly is special. Like taking a picture at the gym bathroom in front of the mirror, right? And then you just put a little, a little, a little tagline saying bad hair day. But you really just want everybody to just say, wow, you look awesome. You look so great. You know how that goes. And so we're just trying to find, we're trying to find a mark. We're trying to find a, a moment in our life where, where, where we just want to show the world that this is a special. But the reality is this, is that we become so self-aware. So self-consumed that even today in this society, people are now finding their self-worth based on how many people hit like on your Instagram, on your Facebook page. I mean, there are pe people that literally will post something, and I see this a lot more with women than men, but uh, what they do is they post something, and I know some of them that are my friends, um, They'll post something, but uh, by the end of the day, I'm like, why did they take it down? And it's simply because it, wasn't, it didn't have enough likes. And so, but that's, listen, that's not funny. That, that just shows you that the world is literally, literally getting us so self-absorbed with our own life that, that we, we forget. Disneyland, you know what Disneyland did? They banned selfie sticks. Y'all know the selfie stick? Okay, they banned selfie sticks. You know why? Because people were being hurt continually. People would be taking pictures, not even paying attention, just like, pat, whacking someone in the head, pat, whacking someone in the head. They'd be on rides, and then the selfie would go flying with phones flying off of roller coasters and different stuff. I'm t that's what happens with you and me. When you're so self-consumed with you, without even knowing, you are causing accidents. Sometimes it's your family, your friendships, your workplace. It is consuming us to the point that it is hurting our society no wonder we isolate ourselves so much 
you know what, 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 what this selfie world does? It teaches you that you need no one. That I got this. And the, and the reality and the truth is that, no, you don't. You don't got this. You don't have this. You can't do it by yourself. God created, he created the earth with mankind inside of it, not so that we can say like, wow, what an awesome God. He creates some really cool beings. No, God created man for relationship. And so many times we just allow ourselves be conditioned by our environment, right, by, by, by the culture that we live in. And without even knowing, man, we're just so, we're just so lost. We're so alone. Uh, and we're so consumed. And God wants to break that in the next few weeks. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to hit this hard. I'm going to have different speakers come and speak with me. And we're going to have a really good time. And uh, on top of that, we get to celebrate eight years. Can you believe that? We're coming into our eighth year um, of being Elevate Church. I'm so excited. Amazing things are, are coming for this church. Some really great stuff. Uh, so once again, I don't want you to leave here thinking like, wow, so the pastor has an issue with me, you know, having this, this value of my self-abilities. No. I just want you to come to the place where you, that, where you realize that it's not all about you. It's not. It's not all about me. It's, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's, it's about people that, that need someone to reach out and, and be a, uh, uh, a strength, to, to be a, a helping hand. I mean, Jesus was the perfect model. He, he didn't do ministry by himself. He actually went and selected 12 people to come help him. You can't do this by yourself. Elevate Church, the only reason that we exist and that we're, we're doing what we're doing and we're progressing constantly as a church is because there's wonderful, amazing people that have literally put their hands to the plow and they're doing something with us. Uh, God didn't give me a vision. God gave us a vision, right? I, I don't like it when people say, please, if you ever say this, like, yeah, that's the church I go to. No, I want you to feel more like, no, that's my church I go to. That's my house. You know, that's my vision. I want you to embrace it, and, uh, and you watch and see what God will do it. But you know what? There's another issue that we don't talk a lot about, and that's our spiritual selfie. Because think about it. The spiritual selfie also becomes a, it can become an issue because when you come to church, you're hearing, be generous, you know, be servants, you know, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You're, you're hearing all these things in church. And, and without even knowing sometimes, you can also have this, this spiritual selfie where you're just so consumed just trying to do it all. And you're, you're you know, what? You're, you're, you're just wanting to be a, a better Christian, a better follower of Christ. I, I want to be a better husband, a better father. I, I want to be a better, a better sibling. And, and I want to be a, a better business person making sure that, that I have biblical principles. And so you could be so self-consumed also with being a spiritual selfie person as well so this affects us in many ways and Jesus is is having a a conversation and I want I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of bring a spin on this because I'm sure many you have read this verse before in Luke chapter 13 but I'm gonna show you a whole other angle you know because it's all about the angle right when you take that selfie you're always trying to make yourself look skinnier buffer wider well I don't know what you do but it's all about the anger. As a matter of fact, you know what? There is no such thing as real anymore. There isn't. You know why? We live in a filtered life, right? Same thing with selfies. Come on, there's no real. It's hard to find real pictures nowadays because, you know, they've, they've downloaded a bazillion apps and you're always just trying to make yourself look good. So there's, there's this filter and filter and filter. And let me, let me just set this, up, set this up from to you real quick. I think many of us, if not careful, we start living this filtered life of, of just surface stuff and, and we never deal with the depths of our heart and the issues. And so I don't want you just to be this believer that loves Jesus, but you never deal with the depths of the, of the, of the root of some of the, the, the problems you may have, the challenges. And so Jesus is looking at the Pharisees and, and the Jews and he's saying to them, hey, listen, we have a selfie problem and, and we have to start uh, addressing this. Are you ready? Here we go. So this is Jesus telling them a story. He says, then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it but did not find anything. So let me just set this up. If you read the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament, 
Okay, there are so many scriptures that talk about trees. As a matter of fact, in the scriptures, not only Jesus, but many of the prophets described us as trees. For example, the Bible says that we are trees, we are like trees planted by the rivers of water. And so wherever the water flows, the Bible says then we begin to flourish. Well, we know that the word water is a, it's symbolic as to God's word. He is the water. He is the word of life. And he's the one that brings life to my tree, my roots, etc. So um, I want you to understand this. As Jesus is telling the story, he's really trying to get these people to look at themselves. And so I want you to look at yourself as well today. And so he says, so um, he, uh, he went up to the fig tree and he went and he looked and there was no fruit on it. Now I'm going to be honest with you, okay? And you may not like this, but you got to hear the truth. Once you become a believer, God expects fruit from your life. He expects it. He expects it in your marriage. He expects it in your family. He expects it in your parenting. He expects it in your business. He expects it in your conduct. He expects it in everything you do. There is an expectation that God places on a believer, on a follower of Jesus Christ. He places an expectation. You know why? Well, think about it. Many of you, you expect God to provide for you. You expect God to heal you, right? You expect God to give you peace. You expect God to answer your prayers, right? You expect God to reach your family. You expect God to, to, uh, to uh, allow him to manifest himself in a worship service like we had today where all of a sudden you expected to come to church to experience God. I mean, so don't, don't ever think that you don't set expectations. Everyone sets an expectation. Well, guess what? God expects his people to be fruitful, but it's not, it's not because he's this angry, uh, mean uh, uh, vineyard boss that is saying, I better get, no, God wants you to flourish. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have peace. God wants you to have joy. God wants you to be able to support not only yourself, but God wants you to support your family and be blessed. You know, for all you singles, God wants you to be a blessed single person and not always stressed about and worried about your worth. He, he, he has an expectation to see fruit. So Jesus is saying, hey, listen, there's got to there's got to be some fruit in your life that you and I, that we're in relationship. You can't just say, yeah, I believe in God, and there's no fruit of that. There's got to be fruit. Are you guys hearing me? There must be fruit. And I'll get more into that this week because we're going to be talking about that. So he says, so he went to the tree, and he's like, man, there's no fruit on this tree. What is wrong? I created this person to bear fruit. I created this person to, to be progressive. I created this person to... To have a great family life. I created this person to, to have a great relationship with me. But there's nothing on here. In verse 7. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard. For three years now. Everybody say three years. Three. Look, at, look at this. For three years now. This is, this is the vineyard. He says for three years. Okay. Three years. I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. And haven't found any. You know some of us. We've been walking with God for six months. One year, two years, three years, five years. I don't know how long you've been walking with God. But you have to honestly ask yourself, man, have I been having spiritual fruit, spiritual growth? Am I growing in this relationship with God? Or am I, am I stagnant? Am I just going with the emotions of, of, of just, you know, just going to church and, and just wanting to feel right about myself again. I just want to feel good, self-absorbed. I'm just doing this. I want to feel, I want to be right with God. You know, that, that sounds like performance to me. God doesn't want a robot. God wants a person that he can have a relationship with. God wants intimacy with you, right? What's intimacy? Into me see God. Come on, let's keep it real. God doesn't want filters. God wants the raw and the real. God wants you to talk to him Right where you're at, say, God, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's my issues. Here's my sin. God, here, into me, see, open up and let God in. Okay, so he goes there and he's like, man, it's been three years. And you know what the, the vineyard said? He says, cut it down. Now, most of us would be like, dang, that is one angry God. What does he mean, cut it down? We'll get into that. 
Why should it use up the soil? Why should it use up? Let me just tell you something. If you were an owner of a business that was thriving and you had a supervisor, you had a manager, an employee that was stealing from you, that was not working the eight hours you expected them to work, that was not showing up on time, that was causing you to lose customers, that was causing you to lose thousands and thousands of dollars every single year. Would you keep that person? Heck to the no. You wouldn't. You would immediately say, cut, you're fired, you're out. I mean, if you have any sense of, of, of growth and, and any, any, any perspective of, of wanting to better your, your business, your life, you wouldn't put up with that. How is it that we as believers, we look at the word and then we just feel like we can just do whatever the heck we want? We can't. That's what this story is about. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. I want you to understand this. So he says, cut it out. Get rid of it. Cut it. But look at this. He says, sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. Everybody say one more year. Come on. I believe that the grace, this is not just the story of truth, but it's also a story of grace for your life. Because when God brings you truth, many of us feel condemned, but God doesn't bring truth to condemn you. God brings you truth to bring you awareness of where you're at, but then he gives you grace. He gives you one more year to get it right. He says, just give it one more year. One more year. He says, an aisle. Let me say an aisle. An aisle dig around it and I'll fertilize it and if it bears fruit next year awesome fine but if it doesn't bear fruit then and only then then go ahead and cut it off the reality is this is that God gives us time to repent God gives us time to come to the place and accept the fact that maybe there are some things that have kept us from this relationship between God and I. And let me tell you something. And sometimes those things can be idols that we've brought into our life. But idols can also be in the form of people. And people can keep you from your spiritual growth. People can keep you from ever coming to that place where you, you, you begin to grow. And you, become, you, begin, you begin to become the person that God designed and created you to become. And so this man is saying, hey, please. Just, just one more year, bear with me. Now, let me break it down for you what this scripture is saying. Put my points up real quickly here. Here's the breakdown of Luke 13. So, number one, God represents the owner of the vineyard. He's the owner. So, Jesus is talking about the owner. Do you realize that the Bible says this, that you were bought at a price? In other words, your salvation, it wasn't worth less. Okay? It was worth everything. It was priceless. I mean, it cost Jesus his blood. So Jesus is telling him, hey, listen, you can't just think that you can just treat this vineyard like whatever. I mean, God paid for this vineyard, and he expects this vineyard to produce. He expects this vineyard to expand. He expects this vineyard to increase. I mean, that's not a bad thing. How many want to increase in finances? How many want to increase in joy? And how many want to expand in your, in your family life? How many would like to, maybe you live in an apartment right now. How many would like to have a home one day? Well, God wants to bless you. And so he represents the owner. He's the owner of your life. Say it, I'm not my own. But we live like we're our own. You know, you know what? I think most people, most people have a challenge accepting the truth because we've already came up with our own uh, theology, right? And we've twisted it so that it fits perfectly in my lifestyle. That's called twisting the scripture. Okay, number two. The vineyard is you. The vineyard is me. Number three, God bless you. Number three, three guys. Thank you. He's like, yes, <laughs> thank you so much. The coming of the owner for fruit is God's desire that we should produce fruit. So we know the story says, and so the owner came. Listen, and so the owner came. Just like today, God's presence came, and, and, and here's the deal, is that he came for the purpose that he desires. Do you realize that God desires 
the peace you've been looking for more than you desire it? God desires your success more than you desire success. God desires more health than you desire the health that you're looking for right now. God's desire will always trump whatever desire you have. God wants it more than you want it. That's, that's so awesome that we have a God who, who comes, he comes and he shows up. God will show up just for you today. You know why? Because he desires you. God shows up to church just because he desires you. You didn't come to see him. God's been waiting for you all night long. And then you showed up. God's like, yep, that's my son. So he wants it more than you do. He wants it more than you do. He does. And so he desired. Number four, look at this. And so the bareness of the tree, this is where it gets sad, but don't worry, I'll bring you back up again. The bareness of the tree is the wickedness or the lack of personal spiritual growth in God. So when he comes to the tree, when he approaches you or when he approaches me and he's looking at it, okay, just picture you right now. This is you right now. This is me. This is Mauricio. And so when he approaches Mauricio, he's looking at me. And he's coming because you know what? He owns me. He loves me. He, protect, he, even, he even created a whole vineyard for me. Do you realize that God created a whole plan for your life? God says the plans I have for you are not to harm you, but to prosper you, that you may have good success, that I may give you a future with hope. So I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of his team. I want to be a part of God's team because God already has a plan for me. My plans, I've already realized my plans suck. Man, I've jacked up my life so good. Like I have been good and messing up my life before Christ. Then I came to Christ, and then I just became his little trim, like, okay, do your thing, God. And, and some of the pruning hurts too, but God looks at you, and he begins to look at this tree, and he says, okay, let's start addressing the reason why this branch isn't growing. You see, there may be an area in your life that you're not growing in. That could be in the area of obedience. You know, that could be your family life. You know, that can be your, your single life. You know, you can be promiscuous. And you know what? There's no fruit there. You're wondering, well, how come I can't find anyone? How come there's no right man, no right woman for me? Because you know what? You keep doing it your way. And then you're trying to figure out why. Why can't I be happy? God's not trying to keep happiness from you. It's the fact that we start doing things our way. And so God looks at it and he says this. He says, you know what? There, there may be some wickedness. And therefore, that's the barrenness that's happening here. There may be some lack of personal spiritual growth in God because we just, we just refuse. And I don't know about you, but it took someone to reach me. Somebody found me and, and took the time for two years to share Jesus with me. I was far away from God, but this person, man, just kept talking Jesus. And what was even more strange was, you know what, in those days, uh, I, I just didn't, I didn't like anybody. I didn't like, I didn't even like my own people, Hispanic people. You know what I'm saying? I didn't. I hated Mexicans and Latinos. I didn't like them. They annoyed me. They did. But I didn't like white people either. I didn't like black people. I didn't like anybody. That's how jacked up I was. So if you saw me, that was me right there, man. Just dried up, just angry, bitter, resentful, hated the world. I only liked the kind that, that fit in my little box. But, but you know what? The guy who shared Jesus with me was this white boy. Yeah. But you know what? But he had boldness. You see, he taught me how to cro cross the boundaries of, of racial tension. That it doesn't matter where you, see, stop being conformed to your environment. Stop letting your environment be the why you're not further. No, we got to come back and look at yourself. Look inwardly. But sometimes it's hard for you to look inwardly because you're so consumed with you. And sometimes you have to get someone outside of you that starts looking and say, hey, you know, there's some issues over here. And so if it wasn't for this guy who came to me and started sharing Christ with me, man, he started seeing my, my life. I was withered in family. I was withered in health. My daughter was, I mean, just so much witheredness. But as you read this story, as you read this story, look at what the man said. Go back to the verse, please, in Luke 13, please. He says, why should it use up the soil? But look what he says. He says, sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. And I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Leave that verse up there. Let me give you another, another way of seeing this. This verse is simply 
God is the owner. But Jesus is the man talking to God in the verse. And he's telling God, God, please wait. Please see, that's why Jesus is called your intercessor. Do you realize that Jesus is always interceding for your life? Man, he's always standing. Every time you and I, we mess it up and then mess it up and then mess it up a little bit more. Jesus always comes and says, no, God, Father, just give me one, one more year. I, I know they're going to come. I, I, know, I know that, that they have been, been angry and, and rebellious and, and they've been wanting to do it their way. But, but Jesus stands in front of us. And you know what? Behind us or behind him is us. And, and Jesus says, just one more time. So maybe some of you that have been dealing with stuff, you've been struggling inside. Man, God loves you so much that he gave you an intercessor. He gave you someone to stand in the middle between him and you. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. But don't get it twisted. He comes, listen, he'll always come to you with truth and grace. He'll never just come and tell you what you want to hear. He'll tell you what you need to hear. And when you need to hear what you need to hear, he gives it to you with grace and love. And you know what he starts doing? Jesus will start sending people your way. Come on, so those people that you call maybe right now, like those, there's those crazy Christians again. Man, they're always talking to Jesus. Thank God for them cray crays. Man, they're the ones that brought me to Christ. You know why? Because God sends them because then they become like the Jesus in the flesh. And they're standing in the gap for you. Just think about how much love that person has. That they would actually spend their time trying to save you. How awesome is that? But you know what he says, sir? Just leave it on for more year. But listen. It's not just leave it alone. Hey, man, don't worry about it. Let's just leave it alone, and if it works out, great. No. No. He said, I'll, I'll start digging. And he'll start digging. See, the problem with us in church, and the problem why some people just like to go to a church where you can get in and get out, is <laughs> because you want to just deal with the surface stuff. And so we just like, okay, God, I'm ready to change. And we just start taking the leaves out. <laughs> Yay! Yay! But then trials come. Then challenges come. Then trouble comes. And we say things like this. Man, ever since I started going to that church, all hell broke loose. No. Ever since you started coming to this church, God started addressing some things, some things that you have been very deep. But then you start coming here and we start digging deep. And we start, he starts saying, hey, I will, I'll dig and, and I'll take out the rocks. Come on. It's not, just about, it's not just about cutting a tree. Many of us have been cut through pain and suffering and challenges. There have been things in life. People have, may have betrayed you. They've hurt you. And you've been cut. But I'll tell you what other kind of cut there is. There's the kind of cut that you cut yourself. Every time you fail, you cut yourself. Every time you don't progress, you cut yourself. You're never good enough. You're always talking down to yourself. You're never seeing the best in you. And you cut, cut, cut. But thank God for people in the church, people in the house that will look at and see the potential that's inside of you. And you know what we do every single week, man? We start pulling out the rocks, the stumps, everything that's trying to keep you from growing. And then we start digging deeper. Why? Because you know what? We need to fertilize you. We need to get some things deep inside so that as we begin to fertilize you, you can just stay there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're awesome. Thank you. you, you, you you'll, you'll literally stop what God wants to do. You will literally stop. You will stop. You will stump it. And God's saying, listen, we got we to gotta stop this. And we got to start going just a little bit more profound. We got to start going just a little bit more deeper. We got to start addressing some of that stuff because so many of us, we just want to overlook things. Guess what? God doesn't look, overlook anything. And you know why he doesn't, look over, uh, doesn't overlook anything? Because he sees the potential in you. And if you were to overlook whatever it is that keeps addressing and messing with you, then you'll never grow to the capacity that God created you to, to grow. God wants to deal with the deepest things. But I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to. I don't want to go there. God says, man, listen, I want to go there. I want to go deeper. I want to go profound. Because you'll never live a life of profoundness until you start addressing those things. You'll never get to the level that God needs you, that God desires you to be in. 
as a couple, as a person, as a parent, as a, as a business owner, or a, a person that has a, a call of God, you'll never get to the place. See, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the process called time. Notice he didn't say, hey, just leave it alone. Man, I, I, I'll get to it in, in, as soon as possible. No, the man was very, very intelligent. You see, we live in a microwave world, don't we? Come on, we like, this, we like the, the, the Burger King God, right? Have it your way, right? You, <laughs> please hold the pickles, no ketchup, no mustard. God's like, no, man, you get the whole thing. But he says, give me one more year. There's time. Maybe you've been hurt through time. Well, let me tell you something. Time never heals. Jesus heals. He heals. But there's a process that goes with that healing. There's digging that has to start. I don't want, don't dig, man. Don't. Why we got to dig? Why do we have to dig? Can't we just forget about it? I know for us men, we like forgetting about it. Just forget about it. Why do we have to talk about it? Why do we have to go there? I forgive you already. Let's just go. Let's move on. Ladies want to talk about all of it. <laughs> oh, no, sit down, honey. Why do we have to sit? <laughs> Why can't I just stand right here? <laughs> right? Just give me bullet points. <laughs> That's men, right? Let me, all the men said amen, right? Yeah, just bullet points, girl. Come on. Why, do we, why do we have to go back to you when you were two? Why? For us guys, you, you know, if you ask us, like, so what happened? You I had a jacked up dad who was angry, mad, and just mean, and I grew up, and I was mad, I was angry, and I was mean. There it is. There's my story. But you know what? But God is filled with so much grace that he wants to hear your story. He's not saying, hurry up, hurry up. He's saying, no, let's go ahead and dig just a little bit deeper. And once you start coming out and telling him, let me tell you something. He doesn't say, okay, let's heal that now. He says, no, let's go a little bit deeper because God wants to get to the root of the problem. And once you do that, let me tell you something. Just life, life gets better. But you can't do it alone. You cannot do it alone. You need the church. You need people in your life. You can't do it alone. Let me give you one last verse and let's get out of here. Look at this, Job 14, verse 7 through 9 says this. It says, for there is hope for a tree. Everybody say, there is hope. Come on, there is hope for a tree. Aren't you glad that there is hope for that tree? Come on, can you see yourself right there right now? You may be bearing some fruit, but maybe you're not bearing all the potential that you can bear. And God says, but you know what? There is hope for that tree. Praise God that there's hope for you and me. It's never too late. He says, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again. And that is its tender shoots will not cease, though its root may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground. Yet at the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. Come on. All you need is you need the aroma of the word. When you come here, you start sensing the word. You know what? You start sensing the presence of God. And then when you start sensing the presence of God, God starts healing those places. He starts digging there with you. We begin to address those things. But then God surrounds you with people in this church. That's why we do a ministry called Reveal here because Reveal focuses on the process. It's not just come here and we're just going to get in the presence of God and it's just going to be so beautiful and, and, you know, be all religious. No, it's about you come in here, you get in the presence of God and then you sit with people and we begin to address some of the soul issues that you have in your life and we start helping you through the process and teaching so that you can become a better you. Amen. That's what it's about. It's not just go to church and leave and oh I feel better about myself because I went to church. See you're still consumed with you. You're still a spiritual selfie. It's about me. It's not about you. It started with you but it ends with others. That's how it ends. It's always about somebody else at that point. Ah, ran out of time. Can I give you one more verse? I was going to give it anyways, but I'll just. 
2 Corinthians 1, and we'll get out of here. 2 Corinthians 1, look at this. Verse 3 to 4 says, Give praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father who gives tender love. All comfort comes from Him. He comforts us in all our troubles. Now we can comfort others when they are in trouble. We ourselves receive comfort from our God. Listen, God begins to deal with you. And at some point, we give him praise. And he says, then we begin to deal with others. And we do the same for others. It's not about you. It's funny how God says, serve, give, go. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> I, need, I need you to die to yourself while you're at it. It's hard alone. But it becomes just a little bit easier in him. And then daily we can pick up our cross and we can just keep following him. Only God's burden is easy. Right? It's easy. Bow your head, close your eyes. Father, I pray in these next few weeks that you would begin to speak to our heart, Father. Lord, if we've isolated ourselves, if we've been so consumed with self-awareness and, and self-abilities and self-improvement and self-help this, self-help that, Father, I thank you that those things, they, 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 are, they are good, but they're not always beneficial, Father. Not at the expense of, of not walking in tune with you, not walking in alignment with you, not allowing your word, Father God, to govern our life, to govern our decisions. Jesus, I pray that today, come on, just lift your hand to heaven and say, Jesus, I surrender. Come on, just, just between you and God, just tell him, God, I surrender. I surrender. Come on, tell him, God, I want to be fruitful. Come on, fruitful is not getting that new house, that new car, that new job. That's not fruitfulness. That's the added blessing. Fruitfulness is that when we're able to walk in the obedience of God, when we start looking more like God, smelling more like God, talking more like God, loving more like God, that is fruitfulness. That is fruitfulness. It's not the stuff that you obtain. It's not the stuff that you get. It's not the bells, the whistles. It's not, it's not the cool gadgets. It's, it's none of that. It's not, it's not feeding the homeless. It's, it's being in that place when you are right standing with God because you love him and you're consumed with him. You're consumed with his love. You're consumed with his grace. You're consumed with his truth. And out of that flows the rivers. And so, Father, thank you for helping us. Thank you, Jesus, for standing before us and before the Father. Thank you for being our great attorney, Jesus, for saying to the Father, not guilty, because we were bought at a price. And help us in our weakness. Help us in our faith. Trust you, Jesus, in every season of life. One more year. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.